we will get uh, underway. Just wanted to say thank you very much uh, for attending our session today on tackling air quality in and around schools. So this is uh, a perfect session for anyone who is a teacher, a head teacher, a passionate parent, uh, local authority representative or just enthusiastic individual that is looking at uh, uh, what they can do really to make the air around their school of, of their children or the school community make that air cleaner. Um, this is part of the One Wandsworth Climate Summit. Uh, our session today is scheduled in for just under an hour. We've got uh, a whole host of speakers um, who I'll be introducing in just a second. Um, to kick us off, I just wanted to, to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Martin Lauder and I am chairing today's session. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please do add them either straight into the chat box, you can see on the bottom right of your screen, type that in, or uh, if you raise your hand, uh, we'll be able to come to you at the end of the session and, um, and ask your question that way. Uh, we're looking for a really uh, good and um, uh, kind of lively debate, so you know, do share any um, questions that, uh, that, you, that you have in mind. Um, which, is, which is perfect. Um, oh, one more thing, uh, the session is being recorded, uh, so we'll be able to share uh, links with you to the recording after this and you'll be able to share it with others. Um, so uh, I've been invited to chair this session today, um, which, is, which is wonderful. Uh, I work for Global Action Plan, uh, you can see the logo just on the screen there, and we are a environmental behaviour change charity uh, have been based in London now for uh, over 20, 21 years and we are probably best known for our work on air quality, in particular our work around Clean Air Day. Uh, we are the organisers of, of Clean Air Day, which is the UK's largest public facing campaign uh, on air pollution. Um, we also do a great deal of work with schools and have done throughout uh, throughout our 21 years. Uh, this year alone, we've worked with with hundreds of schools, um, particularly around air quality and supporting those to tackle air pollution in the community. Uh, just last week, uh, we have hosted our Youth Climate Summit, uh, which uh, was full of excellent resources and talks um, and well, yeah, and, and talks for lots of school children from across the country, not just on air pollution, uh, but other topics. So uh, do take a look at that and we will add some more links into the chat as we go. Uh, do keep yourself on mute um, and we can then unmute, unmute yourself when you've got any questions. Uh, so we are going to move on today to to do two things. The first thing here is our clean air schools vision and this is a visual depiction of what uh, our team at Global Action Plan uh, would like to see as our perfect clean air school. I'm going to play a short uh, video for, for you for about uh, a minute or two and then I'm going to invite our speakers uh, to introduce themselves but then also to let them know uh, to tell us really how maybe their school compared uh, to the one they grew up in compared to our, our clean air vision. So we'll uh, play this video and get going. Bear with me. Whole fire, I'll just uh, put it up again. Sorry, bear with me, just enable the sound. <laughs> We're getting there, don't worry. Right. OK, and the video. We were concerned about the air pollution that was being created by cars idling near the school. So I worked with some other parents and the school's eco council 
and we designed some posters to put up around the school for Clean Air Day to remind drivers to turn their engines off when not moving. We use fragrance-free and low VOC products from cleaning products for children's arts and crafts materials. We hold events on air pollution and have a notice board to share information and to showcase our latest achievements as an eco-school. We keep the windows closed during rush hour and keep them open during the remainder of the school day to improve air circulation in the classrooms. As a school, we think it's really important that we raise awareness on the impact of air pollution and what we can collectively do to ensure both the school and our wider community have access to clean air. Our school street is awesome. I'm allowed to ride my bike or scoot with my friends. It's safer without all the cars speeding past. We've got so much space outside our school now. Great. Uh, so that is our Clean Air Vision and you heard there from um, a number of speakers that have helped us kind of tell the story of what our Clean Air Vision is. Uh, Melissa, um, I'm going to, to come to you now. So Melissa Compton Edwards uh, comes from Mums for Lungs. And so Melissa, it'd be good to tell us a little bit about um, your role at Mums for Lungs, but also maybe how this school compared to, to your school as a child. Sure, sure. Um, I, I, uh, with mums for lungs, 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 for
find out more about air pollution, to share information and to really take steps to make the air cleaner for everyone. Um, our key message this year was let's uh, make October the 8th the cleanest clean air day yet. It was our, our fourth one. Um, and, and to let you know that um, actually comparing uh, this year's clean air day to previous ones, uh, it was about the same, um, but it was very apparent to us that actually it's more important than ever that we keep up the momentum to keep our air clean and to show the support uh, um, and to show the support really for, uh, for active travel and other uh, behaviours to really kind of uh, keep air quality agenda politically. So as we move through the presentation, um, just to give you uh, some insights really onto the impact of Clean Air Day this year, it was very much a digital affair with uh, 21 webinars taking place. Uh, some of you might have joined uh, CAD Live, which was our Clean Air Day live event on the day. Uh, We've got over 350 uh, supporter organisations from local authorities, community groups, uh, to schools, to businesses who take part in the day, uh, sharing information and best practice on what people can do to improve air quality. Um, we also had uh, 963 million opportunities to see, which uh, is a number that always amazes me, but our uh, media team tells me that was kind of the reach of the programme. And you might have actually seen some of our lead stats uh, in, 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 in throughout the day, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, so one of the reasons you would have uh, joined this call today is to hear more about our Clean Air for School framework. And so this framework uh, uh, started life uh, as, as a programme in Greater Manchester, where we teamed up with the Phillips Foundation, the University of Greater Manchester, and also 19 schools uh, across, across the area. Um, so our aspiration really was to work with these schools to generate uh, a tool that would be like a blueprint of actions that anyone can, can go through uh, online and really develop their own clean air action plan. Um, our work with the University of Manchester uh, looked into some of the health effects that uh, are tied into to, to air pollution. We know children are some of the most vulnerable uh, groups of individuals um, that are impacted by air quality and it seems weekly that we're hearing of studies around the world that are talking about you know, links through to uh, lung function, links through to dementia, links through to asthma um, symptoms, uh, even low birth weight. Um, but one of the areas that was looking less uh, researched an area that we asked the University of Manchester to focus on for us was actually how does it affect uh, attainment, working memory and ability to learn and for me one of the most interesting parts of the project was that the, the University of Manchester, uh, the second bullet point on your screen here, found that new modelling suggests that maintaining lower air pollution levels by just 20% could improve the development of a child's working memory by three to four weeks every year which I think is astonishing, um, especially thinking at now how much time our students have often kind of um, had not the same regular education this year as they, they've had in previous years. So anything we can do to kind of improve air quality is going to help children retain information and therefore do better in, in education and learning. Um, and so uh, it would be great to hear your thoughts in the Q&A after so this brought us on to our Clean Air for Schools framework. Um, we will share a link in the chat box with you from where you can find it. But essentially, it is a free online tool to help any school create their Clean Air Action Plan. I'll take you through a, um, a, uh, a demonstration of it in, in just a moment. Um, but to reassure you that the, the framework was tested by teachers, by head teachers, by local authorities and academics. You can see on the screen now that it was endorsed by the Phillips Foundation, Living Streets, No Chief Stars, Lums for Lungs, National Association of Head Teachers, and many, many more. Um, the framework was designed really to do four main things. Uh, first of all, to reduce the school's own air pollution from their operation, their own operations. 
to tackle air pollution at the school gate. So these are things around the school run, um, uh, active travel, that sort of thing. Uh, thirdly, the education piece. Um, before anyone can go about kind of um, asking others to change their behaviour, they need to change the behaviour themselves. And so making sure the school continues that theme of education, but incorporates air pollution, uh, that's really important for us. And then also to become a local leader on air pollution. So this is students using their student voice. Uh, it was just recently that as part of Clean Air Day, some of the schools we work to uh, actually wrote to the largest car manufacturers in the UK. Um, they were sending um, uh, handwritten, handwritten letters, uh, not just in the UK, sorry, but across Europe. And, you know, they were receiving letters from Volkswagen, from SEAT, after these students have been asking them to bring forward the phase out date of petrol and diesel cars. So it was really interesting to hear from the students and their student voice. Uh, the four areas I've just touched upon, but really um, there were four kind of key behaviours that we felt like any school could do straight away. Um, I'll talk you through the framework in just a moment, but the core four behaviours that we felt were kind of really vital were, were these four here. So reduce the volume of traffic outside the school. Uh, so this could be done, for example, by uh, creating a school street. Um, second was to improve air quality inside the school. Uh, so ventilation is key here. Um, there are options to pay and for mechanical ventilation, but open windows at the right time and in the right place is equally important. Uh, creating low pollution habits for future generations and using the children's and school voice, as I've said. Um, so what I'm going to do uh, before uh, passing over to, uh, to, to Jared to hear a bit about his school is I'm going to give you a run through now of the framework itself. Uh, so bear with me. Um, right. Um, Jared, as I can see your face, could you just give me a nod if you can see the screen share on, on your screen? Haha, <laughs> perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, so the link that we'll share with you takes you through to, 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 to this page, uh, which is our Clean Air Schools framework. And when you go through, if you click on the access link here, it takes you through to the, the tool itself. Now, I've explained what the tool is and why it's important. Uh, so here I'm just going to concentrate on the steps to take. Uh, so first of all, uh, you pop in your school name, uh, postcode and just a number of pupils to kick off. Then you'll be presented with a school air pollution survey. Now, here's seven or eight questions uh, that you can answer yes or no to. And this simply um, helps us and allows us to tailor the 37 different air pollution actions to be more bespoke to your school. So, for example, is there a major source of air pollution near the school? yes or no, you make your way through these questions and does your school engage on the topic of air pollution already, yes or no, and this kind of helps filter through what you'll see in a moment. As you hit save and you get through onto the actions, uh, this, is, this is the fun bit really, and so what it produces in front of you are four pathways, and these are the four areas we spoke about earlier. So traffic at the school gate uh, is the one pathway. The second are school operations. So these are things like um, anything the school has control over. So it might be delivery times of certain products to the school. Uh, it might be uh, looking at boiler um, systems in the school or using low VOC pens and arts and crafts. Uh, education is fairly self-explanatory, but around the resources available for schools. And then the fourth one is around students using their voice. And so what you can do is you move through the, the framework you can select things by adding them to your action plan, and that takes you through to something I'll show you in just a moment. Uh, but you'll see that each action has a read more section. As you click on that, it gives you kind of sub action. So for example, in this one here, if you wanted to promote active travel on the school run, as you go through, you can see more guidance on if it might be starting a walking bus, uh, it might be creating a low pollution map of walking routes to encourage active travel, um, we've highlighted co-benefits of all of these and then also uh, we've done the grunt work of going onto the internet and finding all the best resources available and related to the action. So if it's from Living Streets or Mums for Lungs or Sus Strands uh, or even some of our Clean Air Day resources, whichever one we felt is most appropriate uh, can be added to your action plan. And then finally just a few things to touch upon. 
uh, our icon system at the top here shows you uh, out of three. So the blue clouds refer to the impact that it will have on air quality. The cost uh, associates the cost one to three if it's free or if it's uh, relatively expensive or, or in the middle. And then the, the time then is effort required. So again, similar kind of three scoring system. And so as a school, you can go through and, and add these to your action plan. You might want to add that one or that one. And as you scroll down, your action plan develops in front of you. You can download a PDF, you can take it to a meeting with your head teacher, or you can talk to your um, uh, parent teacher network, however you like to, to move on it or talk to your local authority. Um, this allows you to create your own plan and you can go back through. You can view all actions, not just the ones that were recommended to you. You can mark them through as not applicable or that you already do certain things and you can really customise the experience. That is it for our uh, run through. I'm going to stop uh, sharing my screen now. And uh, Jared, at this point, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you, Martin. Well, I say one of the things, the benefits of attending a, an event like this is I've had a look now at your global action plan framework and uh, I have an air quality plan um, that I use with the, in conjunction with the Mayor's Fund, which is far more complicated and long winded than that. So with the other school, I'll certainly have a look at your your framework and take that through for the other school. So as I said, I'm the head teacher of two schools in the heart of Battersea. Um, one of them is St Mary's, which shares, which did share a road with um, a large prep school. And the problem was that uh, the prep school had lots of traffic, lots of big SUVs dropping off at dropping off times. And our parents tended to walk, scooter or bike anyway, but would be queuing in a road with, with parents from both schools in their cars, with lots of huge amounts of traffic, lots of idling, lots of turning, lots of angry parents trying to, to drop off in a very small road in a cul-de-sac. And there was a, both schools are very anxious about air quality and also pollution and the, and the possibility of, of accidents along that road. Our survey showed us that most of our parents travelled to school along one of the busiest roads in Wandsworth, Battersea Park Road, and also crossed over one of the busiest intersections, which is the Queenstown Road intersection, which is a huge interse intersection in the west of Battersea. So they were coming through very polluted areas into school. But a few years ago, I was, I was given an amazing opportunity. St Mary's was, was part of a redevelopment of the whole uh, Battersea Exchange, and the school was going to be rebuilt in conjunction with a developer and, um, and with the, the uh, diocese. And the school had the opportunity, I had the opportunity to work with the developer, the architect and the planners to sort of create a safer, cleaner pathways to the school. And the children were part of the planning process. They, they actually, obviously, their first choice was a swimming pool. Um, which we weren't able to give them, but they, they did appreciate the opportunity to have their voice in how the school was designed, how the school was located and, and how the school would operate. So we took the opportunity in this knocking down the school, which of course created huge amounts of air, air, air quality problems and pollution problems as a uh, school was demolished and building went up, to think about carefully about how the, the new school would operate and how it would fit to make life cleaner and safer for children. So the first thing we did is we put the main entrance away from the road. So it's inside a pedestrian, a pedestrian setting um, that's away from the road. So children no longer now have to queue on a road or go anywhere near the road. They come to an entrance that's, that's pedestrianised. And that main entrance is there. And that's where pre-COVID times all the children would queue up to go into school. As part of the development, the planners and the architects and the developer had to sit down with the council and, and work out some, some routes around the development. And so we had the opportunity to say we want a pedestrian and scooter route um, that avoided Battersea Park Road, crossed over Queenstown Junction and allowed the children to come to the entrance on a pedestrian scooter pathway that did not involve going anywhere near a major road or in fact any road at all. So once they crossed over Queenstown Road, they could scooter to their hearts to delight around the development and to the main entrance of the, of the, um, of the school. So it took the queuing for the entrance all away, away from any road, any road junction at all. So that removed the problem with accidents, it removed the problem with pollution, uh, idling, and it removed the problem of, of large amounts of volumes of cars near, near, ch near young children, which was, which was really helpful. We also put in a, the architect knowing their, their sort of, um, the fact that they had to make allowances for clean air and for air pollution as part of their development, put in a ventilation system that worked fantastically in the school. So the ventilation pulls out the air 
at night time and changes over the air of the school. Um, it works very effectively for noise pollution as well. And so we can keep the windows open at all times, even though we're still close to Battersea Park and we can ventilate the, the school appropriately through summer and winter. Of course, during the COVID times, that has a, uh, an excellent effect of keeping the rooms ventilated um, and air changing over as well. So that ventilation system, as I think was in Martin's uh, uh, new school design. So all that was, was a fantastic part, a fantastic opportunity. I think the, the message from that was when you're planning physical changes to the school or when you have the opportunity to think about building work, think about not just about you know, design and looks and stuff like that, but how it can an impact upon air quality or upon pollution or upon children's lives and movement to and from school. Um, unfortunately, the school was still identified under, under the Mayor's Fund and under air pollution uh, environmental groups as one of the 50 most polluted schools in London, which conveniently qualified us for some extra funding. So we got some funding from the Mayor's Fund and with the council, uh, using our action plan, we identified the most useful control measure to reduce air pollution would be to put in a living green screen. So in Martin's um, animated school, you would have seen the green uh, ivy screen at the back of that school. So we've now um, with uh, put in a, a green living ivy screen on alongside the children's play area. So to capture those particles before it gets to the children's play area. Now it's up our play areas on the roof, so it's a bit of a logistical nightmare to get that up onto the roof, up through up two floors. Um, and you can see the green screen there on the top right. So there's a the green screen on the top right. Um, and so I'm very grateful to the council who worked with us to secure some extra funding because the mayor's fund funding didn't quite uh, cover the cost of putting that screen up on, on two floors, two flights of stairs and on a rooftop terrace. So that green screen now is slowly growing away and we had fantastic growing uh, season this year and I hope next year will be the same and that will cover the outside wall of the children's play space and hopefully the idea of the ivy is of course it captures the heavy particles of the air before they get to the children's uh, play space. Just to backtrack a little bit you can see on the bottom left the pedestrian entrance and scooter entrance to the school. The school is the white building through the uh, through the arch so that is now the children's entrance, most children's entrance to the school, and it's become a, a great scooter pathway and a cycle pathway. Um, you can see the road they now avoid. Battersea Park Road is the next photo along. And you can see the road that we shared. St Mary's is a white school and Newton, and the other school is a brown school. And at, at drop off and pick off time, that road gets extremely busy with two schools dropping off, uh, with one school actually dropping off on now. And so we used to queue down there before we, we did now. We now don't need to queue anywhere near the road and we go through that side there. And on the last photo is the other part, is the view, the other side of the view, the view and I say the scooter, the scooter pathway, the pedestrian pathway for children. So that, that that's allowed us to, to make changes to the to St Mary's. And I think that, you know, we've done a lot to, to create safe walking routes, safe pedestrian routes and, and uh, encourage children to scooter and cycle to school. And, and allow them to queue and, and um, wait for school in a safe and you know place less polluted than it was previously. Um, unfortunately, I run two schools, so the second school doesn't have the the, um, the benefit of being completely rebuilt at a cost of, of X amount of million of million pounds. And so it it does, however, sit in a green space. It does sit in a parkway, but the COVID challenges have sort of made me focus on how difficult it was to have lots of parents queuing for staggered drop-off times at both entrances to the school. And one of the entrances to the school is on the top left-hand side. And I'll talk about the, the barrier and all that sort of thing there. Um, and that's it. It's not a very busy road, but with large amounts of parents waiting at different times to drop off, there was children falling into the, um, into the pavement. There was a lack of social distancing. Um, there was large congregations of parents before and after school. And it was, you know, it was quite a challenge for, for um, some of the COVID regulations and ensuring social distancing for, for parents and children and to make the, the uh, school safe. So when I was given the opportunity to have a school street um, in September, I jumped at the opportunity um, and working with the council, we have our school street at the moment. It consists of those barriers you can see and we've locked off at drop off time and pick off time, the entrances to the school. Um, it's been quite, a, school street is a difficult process. We, we obviously talked a lot about it in communication with parents and children. We did presentations and assemblies, but not all schools have um, sort of organizations like Mums for Lungs or, or the sort of parent body 
who really wants to drive this forward, so the Sacred Heart and St Mary's don't don't have those sort of parents who have the time to to volunteer to run this process. So it's been very much led by school staff and you know a couple of parents, but we've very successfully managed to persuade our residents and persuade our um, our commercial traffic to avoid the school at the right time, half eight and, and four o'clock at 3.30, sorry. And I was very fortunate in getting some support from my local councillors who put me in touch with Wandsworth Living Streets and that lovely lady there, Camilla, in the high-vis jacket is a volunteer and she comes on a Wednesday and Friday morning, volunteers to man the barriers and to talk to, to cars and to, and to commercial traffic and ask them to go a different way or to wait and come at a certain time. And so, you know, it's been a fantastic experience to work with a group of volunteers from Wandsworth Living Streets who come and support the school on a daily basis, both evening and morning, and they stand at the barriers, they get to know the school community, they know some of the children's names now, and the children know their names, and they become a real part of our school community, and they are doing a fantastic job at keeping children safe. The top left picture, I was trying to do this the other day, was to encapsulate how quiet it was now. Oops. How quiet it was now, and how many more people were taking their bikes and, and relaxing in the street. It does. It is a bit challenging, because, of course, only that area of the road is safe. Um, there's no idling, and, and pollution is reduced to that, but it's... it's you know, it's getting children aware of the fact that outside that area there are still traffic and there's still there are still challenges and they need to look carefully on their bikes or their scooter when they're walking outside of the school street area. But it's been a, it's worked fantastically well, mainly I think, say thank you to the support of the ones of Living Streets and the school staff and some of the parents. All the parents are incredibly supportive of it, but don't feel they have the, the time or the confidence to to help with the running of the street. So. I'm incredibly uh, thank grateful to the volunteers. I'll be making sure those volunteers get a, a nice thank you card and a, and a Christmas card from the children. Um, many children stop and talk to them now, and hopefully they'll continue through the winter months and help us with, with the managing of the, of the Soul Street. So that, that's prevented what idling did take place and made that area of the school a much safer place, not just for in terms of air pollution and air quality, but in terms of COVID and security and in terms of social distancing. So it's had a double effect for that school. So just in summary, I, I'm a little bit embarrassed that I haven't looked at Global Action Plan and taken part in, in global in um, global clean air days, in the clean air day, but I will look at their framework. But I think as, as head teachers, we're very busy and we have lots of you know demands on our time, but it's important that we try and find time to you know make sure our eco warriors have the time and space to do their work within school and that we take opportunities as they arise um, Think to think about how we can improve the setting of the school for the for for the children to produce reduce sort of air pollution and to make their quality of um, quality of journey much more efficient and much more pleasant. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. That was uh, that was great, and uh, it's a shame that the school's uh, sorry the students' first uh, idea of a swimming pool uh, didn't make the cut. I, that definitely would have been nice to see. Did you get a sense from the students um, out of all the interventions that you've run, kind of which ones of them the students maybe appreciated or noticed or liked the most? Yeah, at St Mary's, they, there's, you know, what we've created and what the developer had to create was a series of pedestrianised pathways through the estate. And, and they have now become like a scooter track. And, and in the morning and in the evening, you can see children scootering to their heart's delight and cycling. Um, around those pedestrian those pedestrian areas of of the development, so that's that's clearly their their favourite part, particularly for the the younger children. They can scooter safely, they can scooter with their friends, they can get up to speed, and th there's very little foot traffic through those areas. So I think that that that's um, their favourite part. They appreciate the green screen. They can appreciate the fact that we are in the heart of a development. We lost a lot of green space when we were developed. And, and that part of Battersea is, is very is very developed in terms of buildings and lack of green spaces, apart from, of course, a wonderful park. So they they have in, they have appreciated the fact they have living living greenery on their play space, but you know they, it's on the edge and they're not involved in the maintenance of it. But they like they like the fact that their their playground is now enclosed and seems safer and cleaner. Great, thank you for thank you for sharing that. Um, Melissa, before I before I come to you and invite you to, to share your screen, 
Uh, just to remind uh, people on the call that uh, we'll have a Q&A session uh, at the end of, of Melissa's talk where we'll uh, be able to read through the comments and, and kind of discuss questions. Um, I'm aware there's lots of activity going on, which is which is good. But, uh, please keep the, the, the comments uh, aimed more at kind of uh, questions that as a team we can elaborate on and, and discuss together. So thank you. Melissa, I'll pass it over to you, please. OK, thanks. I'm going to attempt to share my screen with you all. Yep. Can we everyone can, uh, we can see, see that. that? Yeah. Surely, great. Good. Right. OK. So for those of you who haven't heard of um, Mums for Lungs before, um, just a very short intro to us. Um, we're a group of parents that were set up by um, Jemima Hartshorn and a group of her friends who were on maternity leave in Brixton in 2017. And um, they were walking around South London with small babies and became very aware of the toxic levels of air pollution on London streets. And as a consequence of that, um, decided to take action and, and form Mums for Lungs. Um, since that time, we've grown rapidly um, in the last three years. We've now got three branches in London, um, in Lambeth, East Sheen, uh, where I'm the group coordinator, and Walthamstow. But we actually um, give advice and support to parents throughout the capital. So moving on to the next slide. Um, one of the things that we've very much focused on as having the potential to, to make a, a significant difference to the air pollution that children are exposed to at the school gates um, is, is school streets. So we have been campaigning for school streets for a number of years. Um, so why? Um, they reduce traffic at the school gate and, and, and therefore pollution. Uh, it's extremely important when you think that 25% of rush hour traffic uh, at peak times in London um, is cars actually doing the school run. And given that um, the, you know, the average journey to school um, is generally less than one kilometre, which is around a 10 minute walk, it just shows you the potential for how many um, switchable trips um, that there can be from car to, to walk in, scooting and cycling. And, and the beauty of school streets is that they create a safer environment for everyone near and outside a school. Um, they encourage um, active travel, you know, as you've heard from Jared, and, you know, kids can scoot, walk um, and cycle in, in, in safety just, just on that school street. Um, and also they raise awareness of air pollution generally among children and, and parents and, and the need for us to reduce traffic in London. And uh, yeah, they are a great way to introduce people to how much nicer it is when you're not um, breathing in um, diesel and you know diesel fumes at the school gate and um, trying to avoid getting run over by by cars and also having to experience all of the sort of idling cars and and and, and rage that sometimes goes on uh, when you're in a very heavily congested situation. Um, recently, in fact, only last week, Mums for Lungs, in conjunction with the Healthy Streets Scorecard, um, we collated a whole bunch of research um, to look at how many school streets are actually going in throughout London. And um, there, there's been, a, you know, quite considerable and rapid increase in, in, in the numbers of, of school streets. Um, it, it, it's gone up quite considerably. Um, in, in April, there was only about 81 um, uh, schools with school streets and by the end of the year uh, we think that there'll probably be around you know 451 that will have been implemented which is which is quite some progress so um, yeah so let's go on to the next slide so how do they work um, there uh, apologies if you already know this but I'll go through this quickly for people who, who don't know how they work uh, they're actually in the form of temporary road closures around schools that drop off and pick up time and they operate um, only during term time. Only pedestrians and cyclists are allowed to use the roads that drop up and pick off times. There are exceptions though. If you live on the street or you're a local business, uh, a blue badge holder, you can, you can apply for an, an exemption. Um, signs are put up to inform drivers of the road closure 
and you can either have barriers or, or cameras used to enforce. Obviously, once the, if the school street is introduced on a sort of trial basis, um, cameras are quite expensive. So um, they can, uh, you know, once the school street becomes permanent, if, it, if it's deemed a success, uh, you can then get, get the cameras in and it will relieve pressure on, you know, lovely volunteers um, like Camilla, who are, you know, uh, committing, you know, part of their day to um, man in the barriers and woman in the barriers indeed. Um, why are emergency school streets being introduced? Um, well, COVID-19 was presenting us with major challenges of how we get around. There's reduced um, capacity on public transport. Um, there's quite a lot of narrow uh, pavements, so it's quite difficult to social distance sometimes. And there's also a lack of safe cycle routes to get to school. I mean, a lot of parents are concerned that if, you know, that, that their children are in danger with very, very busy roads because they haven't got protected um, cycle lanes and the means of getting to school. Um, and at least school streets um, provide a, a, a street without, without that room danger and, you know, um, hazardous air. Um, more trips uh, are being driven, uh, car trips, unfortunately, are being driven in response to the uh, reduced public transport capacity. And if we want to avoid a very, very damaging to health um, car-led recovery in London, we, we do need to uh, move to active travel as much as possible. Um, and if and, and school streets can prevent um, crowding at the school gate and allow people to walk in the road um, to enable social distancing. Um, there's also research, uh, you know, growing uh, a number of pieces of research that suggesting that there is a link between air pollution and, um, and, and COVID-19. So um, how, how would you campaign for an emergency school street? Um, we'd advise you to join forces with other parents and also um, speak to residents on the street um, and, you know, understand their concerns concerns if they have any and, um, and, and delay those um, and develop solutions jointly. Uh, we've got a template letter on our website that um, enables you to write a letter to your school, um, your, your local councillors and, and, your, and, and your leaders of your council. You can also um, you know, um, write a letter to your ward councillors. Um, it's really important to get your head teacher on board as they're the ones who actually need to approach the council and request a school street, um, and also uh, you know they they can be um, they can help allay concerns from their staff who who are concerned about how they're going to you know if they do drive to school how they're going to get there. Um, obviously, your head teacher can also promote you know active travel and uh, you know by staff instead of driving. But if, if that's in, impossible, then park and stride is an option where you you park away from the well away from the school gate and you know walk off side for the rest of the journey um, councils tend to um, look more favorably on schools who already have a good record of active travel who perhaps are part of the tfl accredited um, stars program which uh, stands for sustainable travel um, active responsible take stay safe sorry um, and they also look at those schools who are you know more heavily heavily should be first in line for a school street. So the next step is the, um, the consultation process. Once, once you have been successful and, and got a school street and it's up and running, um, you know, do celebrate it. Um, you know, councils, um, you get a lot, and councillors get a lot of um, criticism and uh, it's nice to actually, you know, show them some appreciation That there's a community for it. We've got posters on our website you can, can put up. Um, we encourage you to, you know, email your councillors and cabinet member for transport and environment. Pass on your positive thoughts about the school street. And um, if your council set up a commonplace website for immediate feedback, you can add your comments there and, and encourage others. Um, there will, will usually be, if it's if the school street's been introduced on an experimental basis, a more formal consultation after after six months or, or perhaps longer. And if there is, um, you know, do do respond to that and and encourage others. We've got a number of resources on on our website um, that you can you can access. Um, Hackney Council has produced a 
uh, toolkit. I, I mentioned the, the template letter. Uh, we've got a school streets flyer and also a campaign, a guide to campaigning for school streets. Um, we've also got a Facebook group uh, called Mums for Lungs School Streets. Um, there's some various evidence reviews of a, of a review of the literature on uh, school streets from Sustrans and Edinburgh and Napier University. Um, you can see the, the, other, the other links there. You can also see the Healthy Streets scorecard, um, the school streets data, which is broken down by London Borough. It looks at how many um, um, schools have um, school streets and both implemented and you know, future plans for school streets. And just a little bit of information here. Um, you know, this is based on a primary school, really, just how many people a school street can actually, you know, reach and influence and have an impact on, um, you know, 300 pupils, 50 staff, 550 parents and carers and 100 residents. Uh, you know, one school street can, can reach approximately 1,000 people. Um, also, uh, it's really important um, not just to talk about school streets. School streets are, you know, an important uh, a, part of a package of measures that we need to clean up our air in London. Uh, we we're also um, have been campaigning for action on man, main roads. We were very much supportive of the ultra low emission zone uh, when there was a consultation on that uh, a few years back. Um, but we would very much like it to be uh, expanded as quickly as possible um, London wide. Um, we also think the time has come now to look at smart uh, road user charging um, to discourage people from, from using their cars for unnecessary trips, which, which could be easily walked or cycled. I mean, smart, smart road user charging is um, an idea that's, that's been around for a while, um, but the think tank, the Centre for London, um, brought out a report in 2019, and, and the idea is that motorists in London would be charged for every mile driven um, and the costs would vary according to vehicle emissions, so how polluting your car is, local levels of congestion and pollution, and as well as um, how close um, you are to a bus stop or a tube station. So um, they called the new system City Move and said it could be integrated within London's uh, wider transport system via a new app run by Transport for London. Um, we think that, you know, however you do it, it's not Rosa user charging definitely needs to be something that's, that's actively considered um, by TFL. Um, we're also in favour of uh, low emission bus zones like the, like the one there is in Putney. Uh, we want to see more protected cycle tracks so children and others have safe routes to school. Um, we know that um, protected cycle track means that many more people are encouraged to cycle who, are, who otherwise wouldn't because of concerns about road safety and that it's a, it's a much more inclusive way of doing things. You know, lots more women, children, families, um, you know, people um, with disabilities um, are, are much more encouraged to cycle. And, and recently, TfL has been publishing some amazing um, results of the numbers of people who are cycling sort of breaking all records and they even think that their counters must be broken because so many people are cycling um, on the new protected cycle track that's been put in under the street, street space measures. Um, we also think that um, we need to, where you've got a very wide road with lots of lanes on it for general motor traffic, um, you should reduce the number of lanes and use that space for, for bus lanes and protected cycle track, um, remove car parking bays on main roads again you get more space for potentially wider pavements bus lanes protected cycle track um, and we also think that 20 mile per hour speed limits are really important to um, improve safety um, and you know survival rates for, for collisions so um, do get in touch with us we can give you you know some personal advice um, we can put you in touch with other campaigners um, you know we would really would urge everyone to, to, to get campaigning, really. And that's, that's it from me. Thank you, Melissa. Um, ah, it's great to see um, how important school streets are, but also as useful as they are, they're not the only weapon uh, that we've got at our disposal. And as you kind of ended your presentation there, there's multiple avenues and behaviours that um, communities around schools can do to improve air quality. 
Um, in the few minutes we've got left, uh, if anyone wants to, to pop a, a question in the chat box, uh, please do. Now would be a great time. Uh, Jared, I had one question for you, and there's a question here that has kind of linked into it very nicely. Um, my first question was, uh, what were the main challenges that you kind of encountered during this, this process? Um, and the follow on question that's come in the chat from, from Abby has been around funding. She was keen to learn more about maybe where she could get funding. And I was wondering kind of how much of a challenge that was for you. I mean, but the, the funding for the for the new school came as a as a route of selling the site of the old school so that the um, that the developer, a, a major house builder across the country, could could build more houses around the school. Um, and they, they looked at the site as a sort of as, as that brought together their, their ability to, to generate more residential units. So that was that was a, a sort of once once in a lifetime opportunity. The school was rebuilt. They had to pay for the school because we sold them the site. So my diocese was very sort of forward thinking about how it could improve a, a sort of run down school and get a, a brand new state of the art school out of out of a major developer. Um, but I think the challenge was working with the developer and the architect to ensure that the school voice was heard because of course the developer wants to have maximum residential units and, and maximum maximum sort of profit margins and keep the, the cost of building the school to the minimum whereas the school is maximizing the, the opportunities for the school so it was about keeping the school voice um, heard in a, in a big development the big developer and architect and making sure the student voice came through in how the school was changed and how they felt they had ownership of part of that of that development. Um, I could talk about the challenges of School Street. <laughs> that there are, there are as um, as many as types. There's quite a lot of challenges on School Street. The school's main major challenge is a getting it in the first place, and being very forthright with with councillors and with your your member for transport that you need it for COVID security. And then you know insisting that you get the the proper resources to to. To make sure the, uh, the street is safe and i still haven't secured those i'm still working on that with council and, and then ensuring you get people to support you with the putting out of the barriers and the bringing back of the barriers and parents understand why it's been done and parents who drew drive who do drive understand the rationale and change their behavior a little bit even if they park further away or, or they they turn to other members of transport so that's a communication with your whole school community and there I always use the children to, to lead the to lead the conversation. So the assembly was done to the children saying we need the school to be safer and they and you need to go home and tell your parents that this is what's coming and this is why we're doing it. And, and they are a great voice for telling their parents what they want and why we're doing it. Absolutely, that student voice that I touched upon earlier, I kind of you've echoed it as well, I think. Often students are the best messengers um, and often phrase things in ways that perhaps the rest of us can't, um, which I think is super important. Um, Melissa, um, I wondered if you had anything to build on in terms of challenges of, of things you've noticed, uh, uh, if it's in school streets or, or other work. I, I think one of the, the challenges is, 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 as Jared said, um, in parents having the time when a school is introduced on a temporary basis to to you know man the, the bar and, and woman the barriers um, because people are very very busy and um, they um, you know are of the view that you know why should I have to do this why isn't it council officers doing this and um, I, I I I you know I have sympathy <laughs> with that view. Um, uh, but having said that, councils are also very smart for cash. So um, you know, I can I can see it from every point of view. But clearly, um, we would like, as a campaigning organisation, for all school streets that are currently uh, being filed to become permanent. And, and and cameras is obviously AMPR cameras is obviously the way to go once you've got a um, permanent school street. Um, we also want to see school streets um, rolled out wherever possible to every single primary and secondary school um, in, in the capital. Um, you know, we think all children are, are deserving of that. Obviously, there are some instances in terms of main roads where you, where you can't do that and you have to look at other measures to protect children, whether that's widening pavements, losing parking bays, protected cycle track. Um, or mitigation measures uh, as a last resort, you know, green screens, moving entrances, that sort of thing where you can. 
Um, but yeah, I, I, I think just having having the, the people available um, to, to, to man the, the barriers is one of the big the big challenges. Great, thank you. Um, so there's a, there's a question come up. Um, I suppose just touching back on the funding question that arrived and kind of how schools can go about doing that. I suppose the answer is to engage with your local authority. Um, but if you can show that you've got backing of parents and the community and kind of show that it's not just the school, but it's the appetite of the school community and there's desire and, and kind of just open that conversation with, with the local authority would be kind of what I'm hearing. Um, one question from Ben uh, we've got here that's popped in is, and I'll, to both of you, can schools do more to encourage parents to use alternative methods of transport from driving? I'm happy to start. I mean, I think we have seen a, a, a number of parents get out of their cars at the moment, although COVID, COVID is, is, is setting that back. You know, parents are worried about buses. I mean, where they have the choice, and lots of my parents in both schools don't have the choice about using public transport. If parents have a car, that they some of them have reverted back to it. But I think it's around how safe you can make it. So St Mary's is very fortunate, I say, to be safe in the whole surrounding area. But one of the problems with school streets I alluded to is that as you move out of the school street area, children are are almost lulled into a false sense of, of confidence that or security that they can scooter and cycle around those areas, and that 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 safety continues in in other parts of the road. So I think it's around you know, looking for the whole area around schools to be made, not pedestrianised, but to be made safer, to make sure the 20 mile an hour limit is, is imposed and, and enforced and, and getting parents to the, you know, to feel that it, it is safe for their children to make to, to make other choices. And I think that's that's a, that's a, one of the major issues. Thank you. Uh, Melissa, any thoughts from you on that question? I, I, I think schools uh, can play an enormous role in, in raising uh, parents' awareness of, of why, um, uh, of, you know, not taking your car to school is, is so important. I mean, I, I imagine there's a lot of parents don't realise that all schools in London uh, currently exceed the World Health Organisation guideline for PM 2.5, which are tiny particles which you, which get in how deep into the lungs and cause breathing and heart problems. Um, Many parents probably aren't quite aware of how you know um, dangerous the air pollution is in London, even though um, nitrogen dioxide has improved a lot. Um, you know, I think there's an enormous education role to play. I mean, you know, schools put on clean air assemblies, all the, all the stuff they do around clean air day. But I think there should be regular, you know, communications and involvement uh, with parents um, so that they're they're aware that you know by driving your car your child to school, for example, you're not sort of shielding them from air pollution. That inside um, cars themselves can be sort of toxic boxes where they're trapping air pollution that's coming from you know the cars in front of them. Um, so I think there's a big awareness raising role that's, that 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 schools have um, you know to play. I would I'd agree with both of you and I'd in Ben's comment I'd respond as so yeah it's not just parents that we need to engage with um, it's the whole school community and often um, as, as, as important it is to engage with the students and their families uh, there are others that live in the wider area and it's kind of that collective uh, importance of engagement and, and not just the parents. Um, that brings us to three o'clock which is our our over. Uh, so thank you for sticking with us uh, and joining us for now. Um, before we go, just uh, Jared, thank you for joining us and sharing us your experience. Um, your school fa sounds fantastic. And if I hadn't have grown up in inner city Cardiff, I'm pretty sure uh, Battersea sounds like a good alternative. Uh, and Lisa, thank you for sharing your uh, encouragement around school streets and the importance of that as well. It was really useful. Um, so thank you, everybody. Um, oh, one final thing to say is that the Wandsworth Climate Summit webpage is where you can go to find uh, more information on this. I know that um, there are more sessions happening over the next few days from recycling waste to greening your home to sustainable shopping to transport. I've got a list here, it's endless. Uh, do stick around uh, over the next few days and watch the different sessions uh, coming up. Uh, so thank you very much and um, have a good evening. Cheers now.
Thank you. Thanks, everyone.